Greetings, Dr. Beckett. Welcome to the Quantum Leap Podcast. Theorizing that one could time travel within his own lifetime, Dr. Sam Beckett led an elite group of scientists into the desert to develop a top-secret project known as Quantum Leap. Pressured to prove his theories or lose funding, Dr. Beckett prematurely stepped into the Project Accelerator. are listening to the Quantum Leap Podcast. This is episode 15, Thou Shalt Not. Rabbi. No. Oy vey, I'm the rabbi. Al, what I'm missing is why I'm here. I mean, I came here for more than lunch, didn't I? Yeah, sure, you came here for her. Her who? Her, her. Irene? Mm, she's about to destroy her life. In 36 hours, she's going to ruin her life by having a one-night stand. Yeah. Her husband finds out, and it destroys the marriage, and her daughter never gets over it. In fact, for the first time in 22 years, I've been thinking about having an affair. They'd lost a son. This family was being torn apart because no one wanted to deal with Danny's death. God, it's me. I'm Irene's lover. I loved him, Irene. Oh, and he's gone. Oh. I know. I know. I loved him, too. <laughs> he was so good. He was so smart. He was so... He was so alive. Oh, God, I miss him so I do too, John. I do too. Hello and welcome back to the Quantum Leap Podcast. I'm Albie. And I'm Heather. We are talking about the seventh episode of season two, Thou Shalt Not. And uh, we have a great show for you today. We have, amongst other things, a great interview with Terry Hanauer. She played Irene in this episode of Quantum Leap. Yeah, that's a great interview. She really knew a lot and remembered a lot from so long ago about Quantum Leap. And she sounded exactly the same as she did in the show. Heather. Yes? We are talking about Thou Shalt Not. That was a good episode. It was good. It was uh, not a great subject matter. It's a difficult one to tackle and think about and watch. Yeah, I was a little apprehensive to talk about this episode because obviously being a parent, it's, it's a hard subject to think about. Yeah, loss in general is hard, but talking about the loss of a child is unthinkable. Yeah, I I mean, I look at my daughter now, and she's, you know, a little under two, and I just can't imagine losing her, and I have only known her for a couple of years, you know? But someone that you've spent, you know, what, 20 years with, at least, he, he had to have been college in his age. teens, college age, yeah. So to know him and love him that much more, because you just... Your love grows for them every day. I just can't imagine. A, parents aren't supposed to lose their children. I was very reluctant to record this episode for the same reason. Now, I don't believe in mumbo or jumbo, but I hate even talking about the possibility of bad things happening. Well, and and your mom has experienced... She lost two children. Yeah, and two husbands, really. I mean, yeah. her. she was apart from her first husband when he was sick, but... You know, I, I just can't imagine the amount of loss that she's experienced in her life. A lot of people do suffer major losses in their life. And, you know, either you have or you haven't. And if you have, you understand. And if you haven't, there's no way for you to understand. Yeah, I mean, I I was really down for a while because I had a, a late miscarriage the first time I was pregnant. And... I thought, you know, I was never going to be a mom and I was really, really down for a really long time. But that loss, not that it's nothing now, but it does not even come close to how I feel about the daughter that I have. I mean, I could not even imagine losing her. And it was sad that I never got to meet the baby that I had all these hopes and dreams for. But the fact that you know, I, I have this daughter now and I, I, her personality and everything about her 
Like, I can't even fathom that thought. I can't even think about it myself. Yeah, and, and I'm such a stickler on car seat safety and all of these things to make sure that she's so safe. You know, I, I would totally be in the parents' shoes in this episode. They blamed themselves, and I could totally relate. I would I would probably feel the same way. If you were the parent that said, yes, you can go on that trip and the plane crashed, then I could see how you could blame yourself. I think a lot of people, when there's a loss, blame themselves. I myself blame myself for a loss like that, you know, and uh, I think everybody tries to blame themselves because we don't have time travel, so we can't go back in time and fix it, but we always have that thought, what if I had done this different? Would it have turned out differently? Well, I think that if she did not let her son go, that he would resent her forever. I mean, who knows the future, but you can't hold your kids that close. I I always think um, my best friend when I was little, little. We met when we were three years old and we were best friends until she passed away when I was 15. And her parents never let her do anything. She wasn't allowed to have animals. She wasn't allowed to go out. She wasn't allowed to put makeup on. She wasn't allowed to cross the big busy street to get to the corner store that we always went to. And I mean, it really wasn't that busy of a street, but she wasn't allowed to go past our block. She wasn't allowed to go anywhere without calling every 15 minutes. I mean, they were so controlling. And the one thing they couldn't protect her from, she got leukemia and died. Like, I mean, like they try, they held her so close that she couldn't breathe. And the life that she had was so controlled and so sheltered that I, you know, I feel bad for her because I understand now as a parent where they were coming from, because I would not want anything bad to happen to my daughter. And I can't believe my mom let us walk across that street now that, you know, I'm I'm a mom and I understand. But at the same time, like she had 15 years that she wasn't allowed to do anything. She wasn't allowed to have a boyfriend. She wasn't allowed to have any of that. And And really, it's not fair to hold your kids so close that they don't experience real life. So I understand why she wanted to let him go. Because you you have to let your kids live. You can't hold them so close that they don't live. They will resent you forever. Because you don't understand those decisions until you're a parent. Like I, I was so angry with her parents that they kept her so sheltered that, you know, I was angry with them for a really long time. And now that I'm a parent, I, I realized that they were doing what they thought would save her. And it's tragic that they lost her at 15. But at the same time, when you make those decisions, say you don't let your son or daughter go to the park that day and they're fine and they're upset maybe, and but they're alive. And uh, you don't know what the alternate timeline was that something bad might have happened to them. So yes, I understand letting them free to live their lives, but also every decision you make could be a deadly one, a life-threatening one. Oh, I I mean, I agree. You, There's no way to know what's going to happen. So you, there's no way to protect them from every little thing that could happen. But at the same time, keeping them in is going to make them hate you and want to rebel. And so it's like this fine balance of Danny could have ended up getting mad at his parents and gone anyway. I mean, if he was in college, he was probably over 18 he didn't have to have their permission to go. I mean, he might have needed their money to go, but if he really wanted to go, do you think that they would blame themselves any less if he went without their permission? But then again, if he got a flight himself, it would have been a different flight and it wouldn't have been on the one that crashed. Not necessarily. That's true. But I mean, there's so many variables in life. Life is an endless stream of choices and every little tiny choice we make affects the rest of our lives and the lives of the people around us. Well, you're a firm believer in never leaving the house. (laughs) Seriously. Well, you know, I have, it's not like a superpower, but it's like a thought process that I go through where I see many possible futures. And the future I usually choose is at home on the couch doesn't lead to something tragic happening, which may if I decide to go out for a drive to get something silly. And I ask myself, is whatever I'm going out to get important to risk my life or the lives of the people that I take with me. I think that at some point, the risks outweigh the benefits. Like, 
I I do I do think you know it's dangerous. Certain things are dangerous, but I am not someone who can stay inside. I get cabin fever. I, I have to go and like see other people. I get tired of looking at the same four walls. If the reward does outweigh the risk, it it doesn't scare me, and I I get in the car and I don't think about it. But but at the same time, I make sure that my daughter is as safe as she can be in the car. I, I practice extended rear facing. Um, she is still rear facing at 19 months old in our car. And she has a car seat that is, I mean, built for that. Um, and I have researched every kind of safety precaution that I, you know, that I possibly could have. And I think I think more about safety now than I did pre baby. But um, I honestly don't, I guess I just don't view the risks as much as you do, but definitely different as a parent than I was just as a person. Rear facing is definitely important because internal decapitation, not very cool. Right. And it's funny because car seats have come a long way in the last decade. When I was a kid, they just put us in the back of the car and we wandered around and played. I remember having a car seat with like a bar that came down over me. Ah, and those yeah. are I remember those pretty <laughs> unsafe now but yeah in the last two years they've really kind of upped the age for rear facing you really should rear face until two and closer to four because of internal decapitation and those words right there scare me enough to rear face as long as necessary they don't they don't scare all parents apparently they're like no we want to look cool That's hey you know important. to each his own I don't think that anybody purposely puts their child in danger but just like you're saying it's safer to stay inside you know, it, I think that some people just don't think that things will happen to them. You know what I mean? Right. See, I I think I might go too far because yes, when I'm at home with Serenity, I am watching TV with her. She is in her car seat and rear facing, so she can't even watch <laughs> the TV. <laughs> no, but see, I know that like you... You are definitely the overprotective parent. I take her outside and and let her walk holding my hand, you know, in the on the sidewalk and stuff like that and I know that some of those things you don't agree with, but you know, I'm I played in my bare feet on the streets playing basketball and baseball in the streets of my neighborhood when I was a kid. Like that's what we did and the car came, we all went to the side of the road, but I had a great childhood. I mean, we played outside every day, all day until it got dark. Before I was even sentient, I would be going around the whole town I lived in when I was a kid by myself. I have no idea why I was allowed to do that. Maybe <laughs> right? because I was the ninth kid between my two parents' previous marriages. I was the only one for them, but I was still their fifth kid each. So they were just like, yeah, go play. Just don't go past the train tracks. That was the that was the outline of our town, the train tracks. So you didn't go past the train tracks. Yeah, I guess when you're on your, you know, fifth kid, you're like, yeah, it'll be fine. I heard that's what happens with your kids anyway. I, I couldn't imagine it. We're still in the first one. So I guess we're a little paranoid still. All right. So this is going to be a difficult episode, but we'll get through it. And um, as most of you know, the reason we need to get through this one is because Jimmy's next. I haven't seen that one yet. I've seen the preview, so I'm I'm looking forward to it. It looks like an interesting episode. A lot of people are excited for Jimmy. I'm excited for Jimmy, but first comes Thou Shall Not. And with that, Heather, could you read us the episode recap? This is Season 2, Episode 7, Thou Shalt Not, written by Tammy Ader and directed by Randy Roberts. <laughs> Sam has leapt into the middle of a Jewish bat mitzvah. This would be fine, except he is in the guise of David Bosch, the rabbi conducting the ceremony. Luckily, the main ceremony is finishing. David's niece, Karen, is pronounced an adult, and the service moves to the reception. Al arrives in time to help Sam get through his duties of breaking the bread and dancing the hora. Al's third wife, Ruthie, was Jewish. All is not well at the reception, though. David's brother, Joe, is not happy at all and refuses to dance with his wife, Irene. So she dances with a friend, Bert Glasserman. Many of the female guests discuss their disbelief at Bert still being single and not having moved on from the death of his wife two years ago, though it appears some of these women know more than they're letting on. One of the female guests asks to speak to Sam the next day. 
Al tells Sam that he is left here because of Irene. She has a one night stand which gets found out and destroys the family, something Karen never gets over. Back at home, Karen is opening her presents and Joe makes the excuse of needing to fill up his car as there is a fuel shortage and brushes her off when she wants to join him. Joe asks Sam to go with him though as he wants to talk. He reminisces about his childhood with his father and brother, watching basketball games with his son and laments having thoughts of having an affair. Al suggests to Sam that both Joe and Irene should each have a one-night stand to get it out of their systems, and maybe Sam should just try to prevent each of them from finding out about the other. Sam immediately refuses this idea, as fidelity is the foundation of a marriage. Irene catches Sam talking to himself, but he covers by saying he was praying. Later, after losing a game of Scrabble with Karen, Sam picks up a nearby guitar to play, but this causes Karen distress, as it is Danny's guitar. Sam brings this up at dinner and finds out that Joe and Irene's son, Danny, had recently died. Irene wants to discuss setting his headstone, but Joe doesn't want to talk about it. Sam realizes that their grief is tearing the family apart. Sam asks to spend the night, and while Irene is making his bed in Danny's room, as it's the only spare bed, she reminisces about her son and breaks down. She blames herself for his death, as it is she who allowed Danny to go on his backpacking trip, which resulted in his death. The plane crashed on the way. Sam comforts her, then comes to the conclusion that he, or rather David, is her lover. Sam and Al discuss this and realize that Sam can't leap until he can prevent the one-night stand from ever happening once David leaps back. The next day at Temple, Irene, Sam, and Karen are setting up for a bake sale. Irene's friend Bert approaches her, reminiscing about his late wife, and states that since her passing, he has focused on his writing, a book he claims is about dealing with the loss of a loved one. He asks Irene if she would like to contribute, as she might find talking about her grief therapeutic. Meanwhile, Sam is approached by the woman who the night before had asked to talk with him. In private, she confesses that she had an affair with Bert Glasserman who had approached her in a moment of weakness after the death of her father, saying all the right things. While packing up, Sam talks to Irene, who thanks him for supporting the family through their difficult times, and he suggests that Irene and Joe spend the weekend at their beach house to clear their heads, but Joe refuses. When Irene says that Joe should listen to David as he knows what they need, Joe says maybe you should have married David then. Irene goes to the beach house alone, and Karen confides in Sam that she wishes her mother had married David too as she feels that her father only loved Danny, and wishes that she had been the one to die instead. Sam comforts her and then asks for directions to the beach house, having realized that it is actually Bert who Irene will have the one-night stand with. Al tells Sam that Bert Glasserman is a real slimeball. He has never even been married and uses the story of having a recently passed wife to seduce grieving women and use them as research for his book Women in Pain, which would become a bestseller in 1975. Irene is chapter 6. Sam's instincts were right. Bert had followed Irene to the beach house and was making his moves. Sam gets to the beach house just as Bert and Irene had started kissing. He reveals the truth about Bert and his book, so Irene slaps him in the face and kicks him out. She then breaks down in Sam's arms, but at this moment, Joe arrives and comes to the same wrong conclusion that Sam had reached earlier, that David and Irene were having an affair. Joe punches Sam a few times, but Sam is able to convince Joe that it wasn't true. Joe breaks down and finally starts talking about his grief, so Irene comforts him and they reconcile. Al reveals that Bert's book never gets published because Irene blows the whistle about his research techniques. But instead, Irene and Joe write a book and it helps many parents to deal with the loss of a child. Al thinks Sam will now leap, but Sam has one more thing to do. At the placing of Danny's headstone, he convinces Joe to be more affectionate towards his daughter Karen stating that he has already lost a son, he shouldn't lose a daughter too. Joe tells Karen how much he loves her, and after a final hug from the newly repaired family, Sam leaps. Thank you very much, Heather. Always a pleasure. And thank you, Hayden. Hayden wrote that one because we couldn't find it. We went ahead and put that on the Quantum Leap Wikia to help them out too. Good job, Hayden. So this show, again, tough subject matter, but important. It really is amazing to me that a television show in 1989, we're getting to the end of 1989, we're almost into the 90s, tackled such a difficult subject matter uh, so early on in the series. I think that it's something that people have been experiencing for a long time, though. Like, there's always somebody you know that experienced child loss. Or loss in general. Or loss in general, because you still can relate, even if it's not your child. I... The only real loss that I have experienced 
was my best friend that died when I was 15 or, you know, the miscarriage that I had talked about previously. But I really haven't experienced a close family member or anything like that. So knock on wood. But I mean, I've been lucky so far. Your family. I I mean, is it okay to talk about your siblings? I don't know. You don't want to talk about them? The fact that... I know in my family, it's a pretty relevant subject because like I said earlier, my mom lost two children, her daughter, Edna, and her son, Vinny. Yeah, I, I can't imagine bearing one child, let alone two, but your mom is the one of the strongest people I know. She is. And it's one of those things where I guess it either breaks you down or makes you stronger. Yeah. But there's not a day that goes by that she doesn't think about it or mention them. Yeah. And their pictures are right next to all you other kids in her hallway and she has pictures everywhere and she still celebrates their birthdays and mm. I, I'm i sure it's hard. I think Edna was what in her teens, right? I'm not sure. I know she died before I was born. Yeah, I think she was like 16 or 18 or something like that. She had went to her high school prom. That's what I know. Yeah. You know, it's hard. You don't really talk about those kind of things. Yeah, well, I it's it's rough for me because, you know, coming into a different family to learn I guess I, I got more details probably than you because I'm the new person. <laughs> so I get all the stories again. And uh, Vinny was, you you had met Vinny though. Oh yeah, he was uh, one of my favorites. He took a special interest in me and he liked to bring me science experiments and puzzles and models and stuff every time he visited me. Was he, he was your, your mom's two oldest sons and you are who's left, right? So it's, yes. it was her younger children before you that right. had passed because your mom has had five Correct. children. So I, it's crazy that, you know, her babies before you had passed. But, you know, I'd like, I don't know. You were there when Vinny, Vinny was older though, right? He wasn't in his teens at that point. He right. wasn't. In, he was, I think, 30 something. Man, I still can't imagine even if they're an adult. No, it's a horrible thing. Yeah. There's nothing good about it, I think. And uh, I even had to stop watching like crime shows and stuff when I became a mom because I didn't want to think about stuff like this. It's it's really not a fun subject, and you know it makes me wonder. I I don't I haven't seen the episode preview for this episode. We have to make our own because most of them they don't exist anywhere. But I think that's one of the reasons why Sam leapt into a rabbi, just because you're not going to make an advertisement about such a heavy subject. You know, tune in next week when you're going to be really, really sad. Yeah, I didn't expect this subject matter from the preview that I saw in the last episode. This episode, Sam leaps into a rabbi and everybody's Jewish and Jewish culture and all this stuff. And I was a little bit worried because I don't know anything about the Jewish culture or faith or ethnicity at all. I know a very small percentage. Mostly I have eaten lots of Jewish food because I'm from New Jersey and had a Jewish friend growing up. That was really it. Luckily, this episode really isn't about him being Jewish. It just happens to be that he is a rabbi. Right. So we don't really need to know anything. Yeah, it's not like Sam's getting prosecuted for being Jewish. There's not like anti-Semitic things going on at all. It just he happens to be Jewish. Yeah, dealing with a different issue. And the issues are, of course, loss and grief and... What grief does to a family. And, of course, there's other ones. Um, adultery, having affairs, yeah. canoodle. Kugel? Kugel. <laughs> Which sounds delicious, by the way. I don't... You know, I probably have had it. <laughs> Didn't know the name of it. But it sounds awesome. So the whole episode isn't sad. I mean, it has a couple sad parts. I'd say the part in Danny's room with Irene and the part on the beach with yeah. Joe... I would think that if we were there to experience the loss, it would have been sadder. So I think that they were smart in showing the aftermath of of what grief does to a family. It's not necessarily the grief. It's what grief does to people. And in this case, Joe and Irene stay together because of Sam's help. But from what I understand, a lot of people, when they lose a child, their relationship just never recovers. Yeah, I actually um, know someone who lost a baby um, after a year of being in the NICU and her and her partner that had been together for years split just because I think everybody handles grief in a different way. And if you don't support each other through the grief, it definitely tears you apart. Also, I think when you look at the other person, all you see 
is what you lost. It's a constant reminder and you can't like live in a constant state of sorrow. So that's one way to maybe try to heal is by eliminating that, unfortunately. Do you think that if you hadn't seen this before you lost your dad and before you were a parent, do you think that you would have viewed this episode differently? Absolutely. I mean, watching this episode before any of that, it's just like, eh, it's an interesting drama and I feel bad for the people. But being a parent, I actually put myself in the place of Irene or Joe. And when my brain goes there, I immediately get emotional and I can't handle it. Well, then I think, not to spoil the interview, but I think that when you talk to Terry, the mechanism for actors, how they get to that point and I don't think I could ever do that, act out a scene like pretending my child had died, you know? They really did look grief-stricken in this episode. I mean, I believed it 100%. Amazing actors uh, casting, way to go casting for casting Terry Hanauer and James Sutorius. Great jobs by both of them. The scene on the beach where Joe finally comes to term with the loss of Danny is very moving and almost healing for people maybe that are going through the same thing at this time. Yeah. I Well, the anger that he showed was so how I would imagine someone to feel. I mean, I, there are stages of grief, right? And he was just still in anger. There gets to be a point, I think, and, and not to bash the male sex, but... I think that women process information a lot better and emotions a lot better. And I think that she had gotten to a point where, you know, embracing the fact that he was gone and delighting in being in his room where he used to be, you know, that gave her this little happy place. But she was obviously more well adjusted than he was. He just couldn't cope. You know, he just couldn't deal. And men aren't really notorious for talking about their feelings. So he couldn't exactly say, this is what I'm feeling right now. So he just bottled it up and hated the world. I think he was, when we meet Joe, he was in the stage of denial. And then with Sam's help and Al's encouragement to Sam, he goes through the anger stage, which brings him to acceptance, which is what he had at the end. Yeah, and I do love the part where I was like, he punched you. That's great. (laughs) Because Sam was just like, oh, (laughs) this hurts. It's a rough job. But somebody's got to do it. But I'd say overall, even though I watched this episode six times, it's not one that I look forward to watching. But it's very well done and enjoyable. It's just I don't want to sit down and say, I want to have a sad romp tonight. Well, I don't think that it's ultimately sad. I think that watching their journey of healing is ultimately the goal of the episode. And though it's not a happy subject matter, at least the family is healing at the end of the episode. I feel good at the end, but it's still sad in a downer. So there are certain episodes of certain shows that I skip when I go through them again, like uh, another episode of television that deals with loss. It's from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. It's called The Body. Yeah, it doesn't sound like a fun episode either. It is so hard to watch. And like one of the things they did in it is they didn't have any music in the whole episode. That makes it even more sad. And it's not in real time, but a lot more closer to real time. So there's a lot of silence and a lot of just sitting and dealing with it. And uh, that's one episode I skip when I go through Buffy. So this might be an episode I skip next time I go through Quantum Leap just because I don't want to feel that. Yeah. You just want to feel the happy feelings. My brain's good at compartmentalizing. And when I did lose my father, we've talked about it before on the show, but it was very difficult for me. And the only thing that really got me through was compartmentalizing. And I did deal with it a lot of the same ways that we saw in this episode, like Irene dealt with it. Like when she said, when I'm in Danny's room, he's still alive. He's at college. He's somewhere else. My brain used to try and trick myself and say, well, my dad's just at the store or he's, you know, out for a drive, you know, and that's how my brain would cope until, you know, I couldn't trick myself any longer. And the two parts of my brain would like fight back and forth, which is the truth. And uh, a lot of times it'd like to accept the lie just because it was easier to deal with than the truth. Yeah, I, I can understand that completely. And I know that, you know, they kept his room the same way. And that's always... An interesting thing because, you know, I remember when your dad passed, your mom was just kind of like out of sight, out of mind, you know, let's go through it all. And when, you know, I 
had the miscarriage, I was like, get anything that looks like baby out of my face. <laughs> I don't want to look at baby anything. My friend at the time, I had to call him up and say, okay, go to my house, <laughs> put everything away that's baby, hide it somewhere. Yeah. And we didn't find it for years. <laughs> so he did good. Right. So um, I know that it's hard to deal with, especially bright, you know, in in that first stage, you know, you just kind of want to forget that it ever happened. And it's hard to, what, what do you do with that room? You know, what, what do you do? Do you sit in the room and, and pretend they're not there? They're off at college somewhere? Or do you clear it out and make it a workout room? Or how do you feel about that? You know what I mean? I, I don't even know. I don't think either one is wrong. I think that different people deal with it differently. Because Joe was upset with her for vacuuming the room and being in her in his room and cooking his favorite foods. But I don't know. I think that she felt cooking his favorite foods and being in his room still brought him close to her. Whereas he was just didn't want to think about it. He just wanted to focus on everything else but that. He didn't want to talk about the headstone. He didn't want to talk about it. For me, what finally helped me, it's going to sound silly. Uh, I watch a lot of science documentaries and I was watching Through the Wormhole with Morgan Freeman. Good show. If you haven't seen it. And uh, there was a scientist on there talking about how all times exist concurrently. In other words, the past, the future, the present, they are all happening right now. And It's mind boggling. It is. But I mean, it, it was interesting on the scientific theory on it, but it kind of gave me a sense of relief that even though he's not alive now, he's still alive back then, if that makes sense. Yeah. So somewhere in the past, right now, me and my dad are hanging out, watching a movie, having a good time. That's comforting. It is. And it really, that's what my brain needed to be okay with everything. And uh, since then, I've, instead of mourning his loss, I've more celebrated his life. I think that's the way you have to go. But I think that you have accepted everything. And it's been what, four or five years now. I mean, it, it's, it's gotten to the point now where I think you were forced to go through the motions in the beginning. But now you've had time to think about everything and sort everything out in your brain, you know, where in the beginning, it's such a whirlwind of emotions. And you have to go through the funeral and the I All didn't have stuff. emotions. I was numb. Right. Yeah. I, I got a phone call. I was crying in the shower and then all of a sudden I was picking out a casket and I don't know how I got there. Yeah. You go through the motions. Horrible stuff. But I mean, this is a great subject matter for a podcast. I guess great subject matter for a TV show. But you know, we're talking about what we saw. Yeah. And how we relate to it in our lives. I remember, um, obviously this isn't the same because, you know, it's not family, but it, I was 15 and I was so angry with everything and everyone and I wasn't angry until she was gone because there was still like a glimmer of hope even though there really wasn't <laughs> like it's not final until it's final um but I was angry at everyone because it was my loss that was a, that was the weirdest part about it people that didn't know her were at her wake and I'm like, no, but she was my best friend. She wasn't your best friend. You sat across from her once at a lunch table. She was my friend. She, This is my loss. And I think that that was a big part of my anger is that I didn't think anybody else deserved to mourn her as much as I did. It was very weird. But like I said, I was 15 and <laughs> like it was hard to process it all. Looking back, it, I handled it very immaturely, but I was in high school. I was a freshman, but every single thing in that whole year reminded me of her and everything about it. And I was really angry for a really long time, but I realized that nothing, it wasn't anybody's fault and it, you know, things happen, but it was, it was a very odd experience to look back on now that I, I can't even believe it's been almost 10 years, but it's still hard because you try and figure out what you did wrong to lose that person. And I think that being her parents, I can't imagine what they feel. You know, me thinking that I was the only one that should have been mourning, obviously not because she had brothers and sisters and grandparents and parents and all sorts of family and friends. But I can't even imagine what her family thought if that was what I was feeling. You know, it, it's such a crazy thing that you, you ask the universe, why did that have to happen? Like, why did that plane crash? Why did she have to get sick? But everybody has a somebody, you know? I don't know. It's just loss is a crazy thing. 
great episode so far. <laughs> uh, well, it's it, it's hard. What it, what are you gonna do? Make a happy? No, you can't. There's, there's no way to make the light of this episode. Not at all. I think what we'll have to do is compartmentalize. We talked about what this episode is about, and now maybe we'll try to look for the fun things in the episode and the things we liked, like the food. The Al, food. Al was really excited about the food. He was hungry. He likes all the Jewish food. I wrote it down. Tell me if you've ever eaten any of this. Gefilte fish. No. Herring. N- no. Lox. Again, no. Those are all fish. <laughs> Bagels. Bagels, yes. Yeah, of course. Kanish. Yes. Kugel. No, but I want to try it. I would not eat any of the fish. Uh, of course, I eat bagels. I love bagels. I like either cinnamon raisin with butter, or I get everything bagels with cream cheese with chives in it, and I like that a lot. So you've never had bagels with lox? No, I don't eat any kind of uh, anything from the ocean or a lake or a river or a swimming pool or a bathtub. I eat fish to a point, but I have not had any of that fish. And when a jar of gefilte fish breaks open, nope. <laughs> the smell is just, but I don't like pickled things or things like that anyway. So maybe it, it's like, I don't know. To me, jarred fish just doesn't do it for me. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, it's, uh, but Al apparently likes it. His third wife, Ruthie, was Jewish and of course, luckily taught him Hebrew and bread blessings and all kinds of things. It's just one of those things that he's fluent into. <laughs> Al knows everything. Yeah. I believe he might know more languages than Sam, who knows how many? A lot. Yeah. Well, what's weird is, I, I don't know. He has an excuse for all of it, at least. This is my theory. He has Google on his handheld. <laughs> right. He on his hand link has all of Wikipedia. Yeah. So he just says, oh, I learned it this way. I learned it that way. Because he's trying to seem smart. But there's no way he can know all this stuff. So I think he's just downloaded Wikipedia, which you can do. And he put it on his hand link. But he can read the letter and number code on his hand link. So that's good. Well, remember, if people are talking to him, Sam can't hear it. So maybe Gushy's Wikipedia and stuff and shouting it to him. Very true. Because he could be saying the Hebrew to Al and Al saying the Hebrew to Sam. Hmm. Or David is telling Al what to say and Al's telling Sam. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. But there, there's got to be more than one explanation, the one we're given to how Al knows everything. We'll keep track of it as we go, as we are. Al is Wikipedia. <laughs> maybe Alipedia. <laughs> that loaf of bread looked really good. Have you ever had challah? Oh, it's a different kind of bread? Yeah. Challah. It's like an egg bread. It looked good. I used to eat sandwiches that big. I would make like a sub sandwich on a roll that big I would buy and eat the whole thing in one sitting. But I was a much larger person back then. <laughs> My stomach was a tad larger. I don't know if we have an obesity episode in the future, but maybe I'll talk about that then. <laughs> no, it's like a, it, it's kind of sweet. It's like eggy. I don't know. It's good. But they sell it at the supermarkets during the like the Jewish holidays. How many times was Al married? Five, right? Yes. So this was the third wife, Ruthie. So Al says to Sam that if he has to do other things that he can't help him, like... Circumcision. Circumcision. And I was thinking to myself, I hope he doesn't perform a circumcision in this episode because then I will go on about 40 minutes on the podcast about genital mutilation. I don't think I would have wanted to see that. But he didn't do it, so we won't talk about that. Go to nocirc.org if you want to learn more about it. They mentioned Fiddler on the Roof, and that's pretty much all the Jewish I know about is from Fiddler on the Roof and maybe Yentl. It's not that I don't want to know about it, it's just I haven't been exposed to it. Cool thing about Fiddler on the Roof is during the last leg of live performances for Fiddler on the Roof with Topol in it, who was actually in the movie too, I went and saw it live with my grandmother and we didn't have good seats, but we were there. Um, It sold out pretty quickly, so we got what we could get. But I was there and I saw it live and I'm pretty proud of that moment. I saw the movie a few times. I really liked it. And uh, I took my mother to see a local community theater performance of it and they were really good. Yeah, this was really good. And I've seen the movie too. And it's a little bit different because obviously they have restrictions on a stage, but the performance was amazing. And it was just really cool to see him in the theater performance and in the movie too. Is it bad that all I know of Jewish culture I learned from things like that? No. It's not that I'm against it. I just never got around to it. 
I'm sure most of the things you know are from movies and television. All I know about the 24th century I learned from Star Trek. I'm sure most of the things you know about college you learned from the movies too. College? I went to college. Uh, I went to New York University. With Felicity? With Ben and Noel. I oh. couldn't decide who to pick between the two of them. Oh, okay. <laughs> are you saying, I remember it, so it's got to be real. Oh, okay. okay. Just like you read it on the internet, so it's going to be <laughs> I pr- real. <laughs> I printed it out. I absolutely love the Jewish music in this episode. I mean, the regular music was fine, too, but uh, when they danced the Hora which they did a great job dancing. The music was good, and the other Jewish music sprinkled throughout the episode was really good. I liked it a lot. I think that I gave it that much more of an authenticity to the episode. What do you think of Alan Sam dancing? That was funny. And the look on Sam's face, I love the look on Sam's face as he's trying to dance the horror. He got into it pretty quick. Yeah, but the look on his face is like, I can't do this, and this is really funny. Dean Stockwell, he had it down. Well, he had to. He was the instructor. The consummate professional. Mm -hmm. So Sam's mission is he's there for Eileen. Eileen has a one night stand and I guess her husband finds out about it because of the book that this slime ball writes and it ruins her marriage and the daughter never gets over it. Karen, I believe her name is. I don't think it's because of the book. I assumed that he found out sooner than that, but they don't really tell you. Either way, he's there to prevent a one night stand. What's your opinion on one night stands? I believe that if you love the person you're with, you shouldn't want to be with anyone else. So that's one night stands if you're married. What if you're single? Then whatever. Okay, cool. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I don't think that actually having a one night stand with somebody is bad. I just think if you hurt someone you're in a relationship with because of it, that's bad. Hurting someone is always bad. It's not good. Well, I mean, if you're single and you want a one night stand, have at it. Because what if you don't want to see that person anymore after that? But it's it's different if you're trying to escape your marriage or escape the person you're with. That's a little different. I think both Irene and Joe in this episode were just so emotionally spent that they were looking for something, anything to not think about what they're thinking about and maybe connect with someone else and have a different feeling other than just sorrow and despair. Yeah, well... I think that Irene was feeling guilt and Joe was blaming her. So I think that it was just a bad combination where she was feeling unloved because, you know, he was blaming her and she felt guilty because she knows it's her fault, even though, I mean, obviously she didn't know it was going to happen and she didn't want it to happen either, just like Sam had said. But he was also at the point where every time he looked at her, he just thought she killed their son. So... I think they just wanted to escape each other. But obviously he still loved her because he fought for her. It's unfortunate that through Joe's suffering, he is ignoring Karen. And like Sam said, again, he lost a son. You don't want to lose a daughter too. Do you think he just didn't want to get close to her because he didn't want to lose her too? I think that has something to do with it. If you don't get invested in her life, you think you won't feel the loss as much if something happens. Well, yeah. For a while, like the first two times I saw this episode, I was thinking maybe he is just like chauvinistic and doesn't like hanging out with girls because he had mentioned girls and basketball games and he was trying to do guy things that he would have done with his son, but he didn't want to involve Karen. Yeah, well, I think that if she was a boy, it would have been the same thing. Right. That's what I came to the conclusion of after watching it a few more times, that it didn't matter that she was a girl. But superficially, when I first saw it, I thought that that was the thing. A lot of guys, though, really want that little boy they can play catch with and bring to the baseball field or basketball field when really their daughters are more than willing to go with them and hang out with them and do whatever they want to do. My dad was never around, so I didn't get to do any of that stuff. I know kind of what she's feeling when she's like, but I'll even go to the gas station with you, you know, (laughs) like, please pay attention to me. I was very lucky and got the girl I wanted and I'm going to take her everywhere with me and teach her how to do everything. Yeah, but you would have been okay with the boy, too. Oh, sure, I'm sure. Yeah. Boys are a little bit more rough and tough. But I, I, well, I I don't know. I don't think it's necessarily gender specific. I think that girls learn more literal first. They usually speak first and boys are usually walking first. You know, I think that it's more like a physical and mental thing that separates them in the very beginning. And of course, there are always going to be differences. But some girls like basketball and baseball and soccer usually especially if their dad is into it i mean if you're into wrestling so rennie's probably gonna be into wrestling i mean it's just kind of one of those things you 
your parents are magical when you're little. They're the coolest things ever until you're a teenager, right? <laughs> and then by that point, you already like what they like <laughs> or you like the absolute opposite. <laughs> I'm sure you would have gone to the gas station just to hang out with your dad. I used to. Yeah, see? It's awesome. <laughs> I used to like the smell. Oh, that smells good. Ew. Why am I lightheaded? <laughs> I feel funny. With the gas shortage thing, I thought of our little running theory that every episode has a connection to a previous episode or maybe a future episode. And uh, it made me immediately think of what price Gloria when Sam was Samantha and was mentioning the gas crisis and people aren't going to want huge cars in the future. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. The fact that Al and Sam had opposing positions on fidelity is i think important for this episode and quantum leap as a whole because sam is on the always do the right thing side of issues and al's always on do what's fun and what's more enjoyable maybe it's the whole ethos and pathos thing what (laughs) um you know one is more ethical and one is more emotional and uh, of course logos but that doesn't apply here but you have two opposing positions and if they agreed on everything they wouldn't have very much dialogue well yeah it's no fun to have two people that just agree with each other every time (laughs) i mean i think that they work really well together because they're totally different but they have the same goal and working together they usually get the job done al is definitely more of the fun not very rule abiding person where Sam's the more ethical person. So like you said, what did you think of Karen in this episode? The daughter? I felt really bad for her because I don't know. I I felt bad because she hated life. I mean, she was trying to grow up and, and get a sense of how life is. And at home, it was miserable for her. And I feel really bad because she had a loss too. her big brother died. But it didn't seem like she really got to mourn for him because her parents were such a mess over it that she didn't really get a chance to grieve over him. And for me, it almost seemed like she was abandoned by her parents because her parents emotionally just weren't able to be there for her. I definitely agree. That's why I liked when Sam interacted with her and played Scrabble with her and was going to play the guitar, just hanging out with her. Yeah, he definitely saw that there was a need for it, that she needed some attention and caring and that's really the only time karen was happy in this episode is when sam her uncle was hanging out with her yeah it just she seemed very lonely and really messed up over everything that was happening i mean if you think about it it was what at least a year i think two years almost they said so can you imagine that family for two years living like that the dinner table scene how awkward it was have you ever been at a dinner like that Besides, like, in my own family. (laughs) My family all silently hates each other. Mm -hmm. They're just passive aggressive when we're all together. Like, they're, well, no, when we're all together, they're all really nice. And then, like, somebody will say something. And then everyone else just passive aggressively talks to each other. And all of us, like, kids or cousins or whatever, we all just laugh and shake our heads. (laughs) That's the family you're from, right? Not the family you're in. Right. The my, My mother's side of the family, yes. They were talking about in that it's time to set the stone, and I was assuming a headstone or a tombstone. That's what I assumed. But at the end of the episode, we'll skip around a little bit, he's putting an actual stone, like a pebble, on top of his headstone. So I don't know if that's a different tradition that I'm not familiar with. So I looked it up because I was a little confused, too. And it seems to be that stones are pretty sacred in the Jewish community. There's actually a shrine in Jerusalem to the wall of the second temple which is basically just a pile of stones at this point but there's two reasons either superstitious or not um they they either think it's to keep the soul down so to not haunt but basically it's flowers die they kind of symbolize someone's life and they that they pass but stones don't die so that's kind of like a forever thing that makes sense Yeah, that part of the episode was a little confusing for me because, or probably a lot of people that aren't of the Jewish faith, I was like, hmm. I guess in Jerusalem, in their military cemeteries, they're covered in stones. So it almost looks like they're building something because it's just the graves are covered in stones. So for Joe, setting the stone was almost admitting that his son died. Yeah, and it's basically 
like putting flowers on a grave. It's just a different symbol. Okay. I had a funny observation on this episode. You had mentioned to me while we were watching it that Sam never goes home in this episode, which is one of the first times, if if not the first time. Yeah, he's always at someone else's house. Right. And he has to spend the night with Irene and Joe and Karen. And I thought, well, he's going to try to help them with their problem. But then a little while later, I thought maybe he doesn't know where he lives. Yeah, because he said they're fumigating at my place. Right. He didn't say apartment, (laughs) house, or condo. He said... Wherever I live. (laughs) Place. The place. Yeah. The place that I live. (laughs) Fumigating it. Right. So I thought that was funny. I just got a chuckle out of that. Yeah. He usually, I think, wakes up like in his home or is taken to his home or something, but he does not go to his home once. One thing about Irene and Joe's house, I do this. I noticed it a few episodes back with the back lot, how it's the same episode after episode. They didn't use the back lot in this one, but the house set was a combination of the professor's house in Starcrossed and also the apartment in the Kamikaze Kid. You recognize that stuff a lot more than me because I didn't even think about it. Uh, It was very much redressed, but it was the same. Well, yeah, be silly not to reuse it, right? Yeah, I mean, but it's just something silly. I go, okay, I know where we are. That's odd. Kudos to you for noticing that, because I had no idea. In this episode, Sam mentions that he wishes he could go home, but he can't. He has his memories of home, but it's not a lot. Swiss cheese brain. But he accepts at this point that he can't go home. And I think this is one of the first episodes where they really have come to the acceptance that they're in this for the long haul. They're leaping from life to life. They're not trying to get home anymore. Right. And Al's like, this is it now. This is your family. This is your home. Do what you have to do to fix it. Bert Glasserman. Slime ball. Absolute slime ball. After watching this episode the first time, I cannot look at him in the beginning of the episode and not think slime ball, slime ball. Yeah, I thought he was a nice guy. And I totally believed that Sam was the lover. And then when he had a meeting with that other chick, I was like, no, they're going to talk. I thought that they were going to have like an affair at the bake sale. <laughs> having pickup lines or having a way to get women is one thing. But preying on women that are grieving is totally something else. And she said, no, she said, this isn't right. I don't feel comfortable doing this. And he just kept pressing on. That was really messed up. And lying. Yes. I haven't done this either. Yeah. Okay, buddy. And I think they mentioned emotional rape. I've actually never heard of that before, but it makes sense. It does. I mean, he he was definitely taking advantage of women that were grieving. And uh, she wasn't the only one. She was chapter six. And that table that the other women were all sitting at, it seemed to me like they had slept with him already. Yeah. Especially the red haired woman. He's good. (laughs) Hearted. <laughs> that was a that was a funny line. That was something. You know who she is? She's actually from Clueless, um, which is a movie from the nineties that I I think love. everybody knows what Clueless <laughs> love is. Love that movie. If you don't. But she's the teacher that they make over and set her up with the other teacher. She's Twink Kaplan. I think she's been in uh a bunch of stuff too. I think oh, she was the best friend in Look Who's Talking. So I, I, she's definitely recognizable from the 90s era. I knew I saw her somewhere. So when you mentioned that, I, you said, yes, that's her. It's funny that she had such a small scene in this show because I really like her quirky personality. But it's funny because she's basically the same person in this movie that, you know, the same kind of personality, kind of goofy, but quirky. I like it. The girl that confesses to having an affair on her husband. The chick with the tiger printed shirt. Right. She plays Shirley Winnick. She's played by Jill Jacobson, and she's from an episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, so that was nice to see her there. That's pretty cool, and that was around the same time, too. Dr. Heimlich. You know, that I wasn't expecting that. That was pretty funny. A cute little kiss with history, if you will, but it made my brain start churning away. And I was thinking to myself, okay, if this is how Dr. Heimlich comes up with the Heimlich maneuver, the first time around, before Sam saves Dr. Heimlich, he dies from choking. And how does Sam learn the Heimlich maneuver to give it to Dr. Heimlich in the past? And you say, well, someone else came up with the maneuver and called it the Smitherson maneuver. But then why would Sam react so strangely when he hears, are you all right, Dr. Heimlich? Or Dr. Heimlich in the first timeline didn't ever get anything stuck in his mouth because butterfly effect and Sam leaping changed something that made him choke. So you're saying 
huge temporal coincidence. Yes. Okay, I like it. Or he fixed it himself the first time, punched himself in the gut. I don't know. Or he didn't die, and he looked into ways of solving that. That could have been his motivator. Like, hey, I almost died. I should figure out how to stop people from choking. Don't want to do that again. Right. But that was a cute little moment. Yeah. Do people confess to the rabbis like they do to priests? I'm assuming. Is that like a normal thing? I'm so not the person to ask about that. <laughs> I have no idea. It just uh, seemed different to me. You see in a lot of movies and TV shows, people always confessing in uh, Catholicism, but I don't normally see that in uh, Judaism. I think that they are your counsel as much as they are your religious leader. So maybe not as much as a confession as going to them for some advice. And I know there have been people that I've known that have gone to the pastors of their church that aren't Catholic, not necessarily confession, but kind of talk to them about their problems and seek counsel advice. It was amusing to me that Sam completed his mission just by simply knocking on a door. Once he knocked on the door at the beach house, his mission was done. The main mission. Not yet. He had one more thing to complete. Two, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, the main thing he was there for, all he had to do was interrupt him, and it was good. Yeah, but he went the extra mile and, you know, made sure that Karen had her moment. And he had to, he had to make sure that Joe got all his anger out. I think he he did pretty good. I have to commend the visual effects department in this episode. When Sam falls through Al on the beach, it looked really good. I thought that part was funny too. Sam, I gotcha. I don't gotcha. But it looked really good. I usually mention when it doesn't look good, but that looked really good. They're getting better. They are getting better. Visually, this episode, uh, we watched it on DVD, Region 1, Region 2, and we watched it on high def on the DVR. I have to say the new HD transfers, they cleaned up a lot of the dirt. On the DVD, in this episode in particular, there's a lot of dirt and dust, especially when they're doing a visual effect or titles where there's more than one layer of film. It was just a lot, a lot of, let's say, artifacts. But when they did rescan it in high def, a lot of that was fixed. So uh, I was very pleased to see that. You know what I noticed in this episode? You only see the mirror once. You only see what David really looks like once in the beginning. But they didn't do that a lot in this episode. Yeah. Do you think that was just because it wasn't important? Or do you think it was just because of the different tone of the episode to where if it's more of a heavy subject, so like little mirror gags aren't as important and it might take you out of the story of the emotional arc of the characters? I think that by season two, you know the drill. By this point, we know that Sam leaped into someone else's body or aura. I think that his appearance isn't necessary for this episode also. Like, obviously, in What Price Gloria, they had to keep showing him as a woman. Because that's a big deal in that episode. This episode doesn't really matter what the guy looks like. So we see that, obviously, it's not Sam. We see that he looks like that guy. (laughs) It wasn't a bad thing that they didn't show the mirror. You know, they didn't do it. I actually kind of liked that they didn't do that in this episode a lot. Because I don't think it's necessary, but I've noticed that they did kind of tone it down a little bit. I liked how they dealt with the leaping process. Al and Sam finally figure out when and how to leap, and maybe they're in control of it a little bit. Of course, at first they're not, because he's standing in the kitchen like, I'm about to leap now. Yeah. But then he doesn't. But towards the end, Al's like, leap now? And Sam says, not yet. And then at the end, end, he's like, now and then sam says now and then he leaps almost like either he's controlling it or whoever is controlling it is paying attention to what sam wants to do or sam knows that it's not done yet or when it is done it could be any of that yeah because i think that he focused a lot on karen in this episode obviously he was trying to fix everybody's problems but he was one of the only people that actually acknowledged karen's existence in this episode sadly yeah so i think that he knew that that was a big problem I think if he leapt without having Karen and Joe reconcile, then it wouldn't have been as good. I agree. Overall, what did you think of Thou Shalt Not? It was a very hard subject to think about. It was harder to talk about on here than it was to watch the episode. But I think that it was necessary in the storyline to prove that they're really addressing every issue. And grief is definitely a big issue. So... You know, I think that it was necessary in the Quantum Leap lineup. Definitely not one of my favorites, though, because it's kind of sad. It's hard to watch. Right. After, I'd say, the first two times I watched it, I went on the emotional journey with the episode, and then the other four times or so, I was kind of distracting myself on my phone while I was watching it. Right. I think I've seen it like four or six times. 
So at this point, I'm almost numb to it. But I, I at least know that there's a happy ending. There's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, right? Very well written by Tammy Ader. Really good job. I would hate to think that she's writing this from experience. I don't even want to think about that. Right. I think it was written from someone's experience. It was so on point that it had to be written from experience. That's almost sadder than (laughs) the episode. Now seems like a great time to go to our interview with Terry Hanauer, as promised earlier. A native of Toronto, Terry Hanauer graduated with a degree in theater arts from New York University and has worked in the United States and Canada as an actress. Her film credits include Havoc, The Rapture, and Communion. Terry's television roles are also extensive in shows ranging from Seinfeld to Without a Trace, NYPD Blue, and Showtime's cult hit Beggars and Choosers, where she recurred for two seasons as Dr. Lillian Wackenhut, the lesbian sperm-appropriating endocrinologist. She has continued to perform in theater, appearing at the Mark Taper Forum and the Arena Stage. Terry is also a photographer specializing in natural light photography. She has shot some of Hollywood's most prominent actors and actresses, and her work has appeared in advertisements, magazines, and on websites. But us Quantum Leap fans know her best as Irene Bosch from the episode Thou Shalt Not. Thank you for joining us today, Ms. Hanauer. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's my pleasure. I was very excited when I, I heard from you, and I loved my experience on Quantum Leap, and so I'm, I'm delighted to talk about it. Um, just to get started, can you tell me a little bit about your experience filming Quantum Leap? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what was really interesting was the part was very emotional and challenging, right? Because it's about a woman who feels that she is uh, really drifting away from her husband. And he, the husband, is deeply, deeply sad because their son was killed in an airplane crash. And he blames me because I'm the one who said, yes, let him go to Europe. And there was a, a crash. So he has never forgiven me. And that happened, I don't know, maybe a year or two ago, I think, in terms of the story. And what happens is that we're planning a bat mitzvah for our daughter, and the rabbi, played by Scott Bakula, who's very lovely and handsome and all that, we kind of start to have the beginnings of a possible affair. And that, you know, in terms of an actress auditioning for that kind of part, it's just so full of every possible emotion, you know, in terms of how you feel about your husband, how you feel about the new man, that you shouldn't do it, the grief that you still have for your son. I mean, it was just a wonderful, wonderful role to audition for. Was it difficult bringing that much emotion into a character like that? Where do you get that from? That's a really, really good question. Um, I remember when I went into the audition that I really had to be real. And I'm talking, I think, in the audition piece was uh, something about the son. And I was uh, a new mother at the time. Well, not really a new mother. Maybe my son was, I don't even know, three or four or something. And uh, I, I brought a picture of him into the room. And I thought, you know, should I do it? You know, is this weird and all that? And I thought, no, just the reality of God forbid, right, if this were to ever happen in one's life. So I put the picture, a small, small little picture, and I kind of snuck it on the desk, you know, facing me. And um, when I started the scene, all I had to do really was look at a picture of my son, and that unleashed the emotion. Um, you know, as an actor, what's important is you is to figure out who you are, how you work, and then give yourself the freedom to do what you need to do in order to get to the emotional, you know, heights or depths that you need to get to. So that for me really worked is bringing that picture in, and it was very moving for me. And the uh, in the audition, you know, they were all quite moved, and I got a call back and um, did the same thing for me, and I got the part. And then, I mean, I got the part literally like it was Friday at 4, and they said, great, Terry, we're going to wardrobe right now. And they walked me right over to wardrobe, and I was beside myself with joy that I was going to play this part on a wonderful show. What was it like for you working with Scott Bakula and Dean Stockwell? Well, I'll tell you something. Um <laughs> Scott Bakula is is one of the nicest guys, and I have to tell you, he's an amazing kisser, okay? Because, if, you know, in the scenes, right, we have an almost moment where we kiss. And so when we, we're rehearsing it, you know, you kind of you kind of got to go for that moment, right? So we had a couple of actual kisses, and I remember thinking, wow, he's a really great kisser. 
which of course made, you know, working with him that much better. And uh, just as a little side note, I had also done, several years later, I played Kevin Spacey's girlfriend in a movie of the week. And my whole thing was, you know, cut out because for a million reasons, they focused on Fred Savage and not on our storyline. But I also got to kiss Kevin Spacey. So um, I'm kind of uh, comparing their kisses and uh, they're both really good. But I'll go with Scott for the moment because we're talking about Quantum Leap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's definitely a uh, very good chemistry between you two in that scene. So that's that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, he was, you know, really great to work with. He's he's very professional, he's very talented. He listens. He's very involved. You know, he was really he had his eye on everything. I mean, you know, when it's your series, you really you really have to be that kind of person to make sure that it's all happening around you in the, in the way that makes everybody comfortable. And Dean Stockwell, he was just funny and really great to be around. And we had um, one of the scenes was at the beach in Malibu, and uh, it was a late night scene, and we were all there. And everybody, you know, that's when you really can tell the personality of who you're working with. And we were all just kind of punch drunk. <laughs> we weren't drunk, but we were punchy because we went into overtime. I mean, you know, golden time. And um, we were just having a blast because, you know, when it comes down to it, they're all actors. We're all actors. And we all do it for the same reason, which is that we love we love acting so much. And so when you get past people's celebrity and all that, basically, we're just actors. So um, it was a great set for me. Really great. Um, this episode dealt with uh, an issue, of course, of loss. And uh, it's as me, as a parent, it's difficult for me to watch this episode. Like you said, you you wouldn't want that to happen in your own life. Have you, from any of your fans, had any communications about this episode that it's maybe helped them or touched them in a way? You know, uh, I have that quite a bit. Actually, people come up to me because I've done things that are, you know, like I, I play very human, human kind of characters. And what that means is that, you know, I'm like, people come up to me all the time and they go, you're so familiar to me. Do I know you? Do I know you? And I go, well, you probably have seen me on television. They go, oh, right. Yes. And you remind me of my cousin. You remind me of, you know, my sister. It's like I remind people of people that they know. And um, so I'm able to bring out that human thing. And people have said to me, thank you for doing that or thank you for going back to your husband and that or thank you for expressing that kind of emotion because a lot of people don't have places to express that and I think one of the jobs that actors do for people is that we get to express those things that regular people don't because they don't know how or they're afraid to you know so by me having had those experiences on that show people were I think able to kind of move past some of their own issues. It's a very interesting question, Alby. That was, that's really, I never quite thought of it in that way, but I think that that is one of the purposes of um, actors. Yeah, they, they really do help people, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of people go through things and, and they're afraid to talk about them or if they're not in therapy, they, they don't have a place. Or even if they have friends, they're maybe ashamed of what they're thinking or feeling. And uh, I think watching an actor go through it, I think, is therapeutic for them. Just a few silly uh, technical questions uh, that we're curious about. Sure. The house that the characters lived in, was that on a soundstage? Um, yeah, it was a soundstage. Wow, you're really making me think. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the temple was an actual temple, you know, so that was the location. Um, the house was a soundstage, yeah. They built that, or they built the rooms, you know. I mean, it's never usually like a whole house. It's kind of like the room that you walk in, the bedroom of the son that, that he was sleeping in. Um, yes, that was definitely on the sound stage. If they do that, you know, it's just easier because it was, oh, what was the company? I can't even remember what lot we were on, but um, they have all these huge sound stages and it's just better to shoot because you really have quiet, you have all the lights you need, you don't have street traffic usually. And usually TV shows do that because um, they'll build sets or they'll build sets that can become other sets and it amortizes over the period of the series. So though it seems like it's a lot of money over two or three or four or five year series, it, it amortizes rather than going to different locations all the time, which is very expensive. You have trucks, you have trailers, uh, you have sound issues, you have lighting issues. So yeah, that particular, most of that was, was done on the sound stage. How long did the whole process last for you from auditioning? I know you got right into wardrobe and there was some ADR in the episode and how much later on was that from the filming? Um, the actual, that was an hour show and usually our shows take 
between seven and eight days to shoot. Depends on the, you know, budget of the show. I also did um, Six Feet Under. I was a guest star in that one episode. And they take nine days to shoot, nine or ten. Their model was more like an independent film. They did lots and lots of takes. But Quantum Leap was not that. And I was a guest on it, and so I was pretty much throughout the show. So they basically have you for that week. It's usually like a seven or eight day period. And like I said, uh, the last Friday of the shoot, we were out on the beach, and that ended up going into way into overtime, <laughs> golden time. So I didn't that day get home till I think the sun was rising Saturday morning, but I was delighted because, you know, that was the end of the show. We had had such a great experience, and you make extra money, of course, when you go into overtime. Um, and then the ADR, the audio dialogue replacement, that normally happens about a week before the show is going to air because it takes, you know, once you shoot it, then it goes into editing and then, you know, all the sound stuff comes in. And depending on the schedule of the show, normally the show takes anywhere from, you know, three to eight weeks later is it aired. It depends on, you know, their schedule. So normally you go in for half a day or a day of ADR and you fill in all the sound that that they missed or was difficult to get. And I remember we had stuff on the beach. It's so hard to do sound on the beach because you have, you know, you have the water and you have all that. So I think that was mostly what the ADR was for that. <laughs> and now that I'm directing, I can tell you so many things about all different sides of, of that world. You know, I, I can see everything that's involved and it's a lot, a lot's involved. Being a director yourself now, do you have any memory of the director in that episode? Randy Roberts was the director of that episode, and I, I'm trying to remember. I think that he that, that may have been one of his first directing jobs. That he worked on the show as a camp, as a DP or as a editor. I'm just trying to remember. I think it was one of the first things that he directed, and um, we got along really well. And he was very helpful to me because he was able to to see if I was kind of off the mark. He would come up to me and talk to me privately. And I remember one direction he said is that, you know, your character is a woman. She's a woman. She's not a girl. She's a woman. And that was very, very good because a lot of actresses, you know, you know, we, I had or we have the uh, feeling that we're eternally ingenues, <laughs> no matter how old we are. Um, and this is true, believe me. Um, so when he said that, it really gave me a different point of view on the character. And of course, she was a woman. She was a woman who married and had children. And, um, it helped me give dimension to this character, even though she was acting like a girl in the presence of Scott Bakula because, you know, her, her emotions were being stimulated in a way they, they haven't been stimulated in a long time. But in fact, his direction for me was very, very astute. And I appreciated that. Okay, now time for some silly questions. Okay. What was it like giving Jerry Seinfeld a massage? <laughs> that was really funny because, obviously, I mean, he was in the audition room, and I didn't do the, dis the massage in the audition, right? So I got the part, and then you're on the set, and in terms of a, a sitcom, I don't know if you know how it works, but basically you read through the uh, scripts several days and the writers go back and rewrite and then you basically have like a blocking rehearsal and then you're on and you do the show twice in front of a live audience so what I'm getting at is that you know the first time I touched Jerry Seinfeld is in front of a live audience right um, he was very gracious and fun and we laughed about it and um, I can tell you something really interesting my lines in that one of my lines was Run, Billy, run. Mm -hmm. It's like it's become a classic of the Seinfeld shows, right? So I'm a woman who's afraid of um, Jerry Seinfeld at that moment, and I have my son Billy with me, and I tell him to run. So I said to Jerry, I said, you know, I'm a mother. I would first try to get my son's attention, and I would say, Billy, run, run. And he said, yeah, but Billy, run, run isn't funny. Run, Billy, run is funny. And I said, okay, you're the guy. And every time I watch that show when it comes on, you know, and reruns, the audience just breaks up into laughter. So, you know, he, he was so right about that. He, you know, when somebody knows what is funny, you got to go with them. And he definitely knows what's funny. What was it like playing a ghost on Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction? <laughs> You're bringing back my whole life, Albie. I love it. A ghost. You know what? It was really fun because a ghost gives you total freedom. And you can look any way. You can act any way. You can talk any way. It's like who knows really what a ghost looks like or like right and I mean it's all our imagination anyway so I got to really 
you know, have, actually I'm trying to remember the storyline. It was revenge, right? He killed me or something. Right. And um, <laughs> so it was revenge. It was great. Um, you know, acting is so much fun. You get to play all these things. You get to commit to things and go for it 100%. Um, so playing a ghost was uh, fun. A lot of people like that show, by the way. So I got a lot of uh, response from that. I was surprised. I didn't know that people watched it, but they, they did and liked it. I remember being like scared a little bit of your character in that the first time I saw it. Uh-huh. <laughs> so job well done. Oh, well, good. Well, thank you. Your career, you've been in so many different television shows and a bunch of movies. What sticks out for you as a career highlight? Um, you know, it's ironic, I guess. It's, I did a movie that Steven Spielberg directed called Minority Report with Tom Cruise, but that section was cut. I play a, um, uh, a woman who is opposed to what he's doing, what Tom Cruise is doing in that. And it was, they wrote the scene once they started shooting. They shot it for a day, and then afterwards they decided they didn't need it, which is unfortunate for me. But what was really great for me was the working experience with Steven Spielberg and with Tom Cruise. And I was so nervous. I mean, as you can imagine, right? I was just, oh, my God, you know, so nervous. Um, but as soon as I got on the set, uh, they, you know, I had to wait, of course, four hours in the trailer. But as soon as they brought me on the set, you know, they introduced me to Steven Spielberg, and he had he had chosen me from a, a tape, and he was very sweet, very nice, and uh, and then Tom Cruise came over to me, and he said, "Hi, welcome to the set. I'm Tom." And I said, "I know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you." And he said, "Is there anything I can get for you?" I said, what, what do you mean? And he goes, you drink some water, you want some coffee, you want anything. And I said, no, well, thank you, I'm great. He goes, okay. And he says, hey, do you have a minute to run lines? And I said, oh, I would love to run lines. And the fact that he came up to me and was so gracious and so lovely, and we worked together, it was beautiful, it was a great, it was a one-day job. And then about two weeks later, I did a, um, a job on Good Medicine, and I was in the trailer. And I met the guy who was playing my brother. I won't say his name. And uh, I said to him, oh, great. I'm so happy to meet you. And I said, um, would you like to run some lines? And he looked at me and he said, why? You've got most of them. And I thought, wow, Tom Cruise came up to me and asked me to run lines with him. And this guy isn't even gracious enough to say yes when I'm asking to run lines with him. So what I learned from that, in terms of when you, your question and highlight, is, you know, <sighs> just the respect that one should just like naturally give to somebody else is I think a human gift you know to say to somebody welcome hi can I help you it just that does so much for everybody as compared to not doing that so that was a highlight for me and now as a director I'm very conscious of working with people that have that same kind of positive and embracing and welcoming um, mentality I don't work with anybody, if I can, that um, isn't like that. Makes sense. Yeah. I mean, you know, you're going to spend your creative hours with somebody. You want them to be somebody that you really enjoy working with. What was the rehearsal process like, if any, on Quantum Leap for you? There was no rehearsal time, actually. Um, I believe there was the read-through of the script, the table read of the script, and then basically you get your, you know, your schedule and you show up. And uh, normally there's a blocking, you know, where the actors come in and the director's there and then they block you, which literally is for camera. It's not usually for emotion or for character. It's mostly for, well, the camera's here, so you need to move here, stand here, turn here. And... uh and then, you know, you kind of do it. Then you then you go back to hair and makeup and, you know, they tweak your costume and then you come back in and then you kind of start. And usually the first couple takes are kind of, you know, kind of rehearsal, but really they're not. I mean, in, in television, especially network television, it's such a heavy schedule that if you can do it in one or two takes or three takes, then, they, you know, they're happy and they, then they move on because they have so much to do in a short amount of time. So there's not a lot of rehearsal, which is why casting is so important. You know, you cast the right person, then that person is, you know, almost the character rather than casting the wrong person, and then you really have to rehearse. Speaking of you being a director, uh, very exciting news, you have a movie out. 
I do, yes, thank you. It was uh, recently released uh, theatrically in Los Angeles, and now it's available on video on demand. It's available on Amazon and Vid, and will soon be available on Hulu, Hulu Plus, and it's available on iTunes. It's called Sweet Talk, and I'm so happy and so proud of this film. It uh, is a very unconventional love story. It stars Natalie Z who you may know, she was on The Following and uh, Californication and Justified, wonderful actress. And Jeffrey Vincent Paris, who's done a lot of television and he's now on General Hospital, terrific actor. And um, it's um, sexy and it's romantic and it's um, very, you know, different and unique. And it's about a phone sex operator and this guy who calls in and um, they kind of go on journeys that are... Um, romantic and uh, fantastical, and uh, they learn a lot about themselves, and um, the audience that's seen it has really, really loved it. So I'm very, very happy and proud of it. Thank you for asking. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Me, personally, I love the work you did in Quantum Leap, and it meant a lot. Thank you. And I really appreciate what you said about my work and, and that uh, it touched you, Albie. Uh, that makes um, that makes a lot of uh difference to me. So thank you very much. And thanks for doing this. I think it's great. That was a great interview. Um, She seemed to remember a lot about recording and but she recalled a lot of details about the episode and she said she hadn't seen it in a while. That's awesome that she remembered so much. I remember yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that she seems really smart and well-spoken though. That was really an awesome interview. That movie she was talking about, Sweet Talk, we watched it last night on Amazon Video On Demand on our Roku and it looked really good. It was a good movie, I think. It was something I've never seen before. It was very different. And that never happens. Right. It was an original idea. I think it was adapted from a play. And I mentioned that while we were watching it. This would make a good play. Yeah. And then at the end, we saw that. But it was a really interesting idea. And it wasn't what I thought it was going to be in a good way. About 20 minutes in, I was saying to myself, I think I like this movie. I'm going to like this movie. Where's it going? I have no idea. You just saw a woman in underwear and you were like, I love this movie. That helped. <laughs> that helped. It was a very sensual movie, but it wasn't distasteful at all. And erotic in the brain way, not the physical way. Yeah, it, it was a really, really cool movie and a cool concept. I really had no idea where it was going to end up. And it, I was really pleased with the ending. It's worth checking out. And you can find out more about that on quantumleappodcast.com slash sweet talk. And thank you, Terry, for that awesome interview and for directing that movie it was good very good job and now we have a segment written by hayden mcqueenie and read by john bucanis thou shall not is not a bad episode of quantum leap i don't think there are any bad episodes the acting of the guest cast was fantastic. It was very difficult not to feel the pain that the Bosch family was going through and to not feel the confusion and regret faced by the woman who was being used by Burke Glasserman. But truth be told, Thou Shall Not is one of my least favorite episodes of Quantum Leap and is the one I often skip for numerous reasons. There is a lot about this episode that could be improved upon. First, the starting act seems to be written for no other reason than to incorporate Jewish culture into an episode. This would be fine normally, but it was taken way too far, incorporating just about every Jewish stereotype there is. Even this would not be bad if the Jewish factor at least had some significance to the story, but the fact that the family was Jewish was completely inconsequential to the outcome. Really, the only saving factor was that the bat mitzvah celebration gave us an opportunity to see the other woman discussing their feelings about Bert Glasserman. And the fact that Sam was the rabbi, he was in a position to hear the confession, which helped him piece together that Bert was using Irene the same way. However, this could have been done in other ways. There is no reason why the party had to be a bar mitzvah. It could have been a birthday party or some other get-together, and Sam could have found out about Bert in another way, like walking in on Bert and the woman who confessed in the act at this party and then discussing it with her. 
the entire Jewish focus was completely unnecessary. And it seems like the writer felt she had to put it in there because the story was thin and needed a little thickening up with some religion. Second, the story itself was a massive downer. When juxtaposed against upbeat positions like Good Morning Peoria and What Price Gloria, it feels out of place. That's not to say all episodes should be upbeat. That would be unrealistic when the whole premise of the show is to put right what once went wrong. But a darker episode such as this needs some lighthearted moments so as not to depress the audience. A good example is Blind Faith, another dark episode we discussed recently. Even though it dealt with some very heavy subject matter, murder, smothering love, it did a much better job because of lighthearted moments, such as Sam playing the piano and his date with Michelle, breaking up the heavy parts. In Thou Shall Not, however, the entire second act and most of the third act were depressing. The only time we have a lighthearted moment is when Sam is playing Scrabble with Kalan. But even that doesn't last long because Kalan is distressed the moment Sam picks up Danny's guitar. Now that I think about it, maybe my original criticism of the Jewish stereotyping was premature. If the bar mitzvah party had been placed in the second act rather than the first, it could have broken up the depressing moments enough to save the viewing experience. The final reason why I don't like this episode much is because it feels like the entire story is unnecessary. What is the one event which caused all of the family's pain such as their grief, Joe's distance, Khan's feelings of abandonment, and Irene's confusion and vulnerability, which left her open to be taken advantage of. Danny's death. I find it hard to believe that when there's such a single event that causes so much disaster that Sam doesn't leap there to prevent it. Instead, we are subjected to an episode with him cleaning up the mess. Really, the only saving grace is the ending. I really like the fact that Irene and Joe write a book to deal with their own grief and that this helps other parents going through the same thing. In fact, I choose to believe that this is the reason why Sam didn't leap to save Danny. I discussed in the Blind Faith episode why Sam can't save everyone. Some events need to play out for the greater good. Maybe this book is what GTWF wanted in the long run. The other things that I do like, psychologically speaking, the reaction that the family had towards Danny's death was very realistic. It is very believable that Irene would blame herself, since she was the one who agreed to let him go on the trip even though what happened is completely out of her control. It was also very believable for Khan to blame herself and want to take Danny's place, as children often do blame themselves for things that are out of their control. Distance from others is also a common coping mechanism, so Joe internalizing his feelings and keeping his distance from the family was also spot on. Again, it is the acting in this episode which saves it, but not enough to make me want to watch it on rotation. Okay, admit it, there's at least one TV show you just can't get enough of. And for those shows, watching just isn't enough. You want to watch them, oh talk about them, God. and listen to what other fans are saying. Did you see that? TV Talk is a new app for fans like you who want to talk about their favorite shows wherever they are. Here's how it works. First, all you have to do is watch your show. Once the show starts, open up the TV Talk app on your smartphone or tablet and, well, talk. You can record your comments about your favorite characters or mind-blowing plot twists. The next morning, you and fans everywhere can listen to a talk show that's all about the episode and highlights the best comments from the night before, maybe even yours. And even if you DVR your shows or watch them later on demand, don't worry. TV Talk is available on demand, too. Watch, talk, listen. It's that easy. Just go to tvtalk.com now and download the app to keep enjoying your show long after the credits roll. Thanks, Hayden. I always feel smarter after your segments. We always learn something from him. Exactly. He is a teacher, and he is teaching us about Quantum Leap. This episode takes place on Groundhog's Day. Probably before the movie came out. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I learned in this episode the difference between a bat mitzvah and a bar mitzvah. What's the difference? One is for a girl and one is for a boy. Oh, well, yeah. I had no idea. I always thought that just boys got bar mitzvahs. I think I learned that from like the wedding singer or something. Love that movie and the play. Hey, yeah, which is close to the movie. I actually know someone who proposed with that song at the at the end. I want to grow old with you. That's awesome. Yeah. Al's fashion in this episode. I like his lightning bolt gold tie. Almost like the Swiss cheese tie, but it was more like a lightning bolt. 
no chrome jacket, but there was the return of the orange creamsicle colored shirt. And there was chrome shoes. Those, they were gold, I thought. You're right. They were gold. And they reflected on the dance floor, which holograms don't reflect. Whoops. <laughs> There's not but a lot. How lo- could you make them not? True. I mean, in the in the production standpoint. And we might not have been seeing the reflection off the dance floor. We might have been seeing the hologram of the reflection from the imaging chamber. Mind blown. <laughs> um, not much trivia this episode. We have some feedback. When we asked on Facebook, what sort of scenarios would you like to see Sam leap into? Mandy Baker said, how about someone deaf? Then the entire episode could be done in sign language with captions. That would be good. I'm sure he knows sign language. Sam knows everything. If he doesn't, Al does. Right. Andrew Garber said, into an actor named Scott Bakula, who is going on an audition to a TV show where he would play a time traveler. (laughs) Whoa. (laughs) Mind blown. Robert Ewald said, as Tom Selleck in Magnum, it was an idea they were going to try to do if there was a season six. Maybe as one of MLK Jr.'s friends where he encourages him when things were behind the scenes. Or he tells Jordan not to give up working on his jump shot. Tim Glowitz said, how about Sam leaps into Albert Einstein? He has to help him with the whole E equals MC squared thing. Oh, see, that would be kind of cool. Yeah, that would be cool. But then he would have the decision to make, you know, about the atomic bomb and whether it's good or bad. Yeah, that could change a lot of things. But it could have a funny part in the episode where he influences his hairstyle. Oh, true. Mischief Maker Studios said, I have some ideas. I would have loved to see Sam leap into Ryan White as well as an autistic person. That would have been good. Ryan White was the child with AIDS. Oh. Yeah, it's very sad. John F. Mollard says, himself, the day before he leaps, a final episode. Wow, that would be pretty cool. That would be cool. Jeff Stray said, I think Sam should have leapt to the future. I think they were floating that as an idea for the sixth season premiere if the show didn't get canceled. I guess technically it's still in his lifespan, right? Yeah, I'm hoping he's alive after (laughs) the time he leaps. We'll see. Ken Rolt says, or Sam leaps out of his own lifetime into a future descendant of his called Jonathan Archer. Oh, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. That would connect the two shows. And then we have four seasons of Enterprise, five seasons of Quantum Leap. That's nine seasons. I'm good. Yeah, you definitely get your fill with Scott Bakula, right? <laughs> you can never have too much Bakula in your life. That should be a t-shirt. Challenge accepted. <laughs> That's all for our feedback in this episode. We want to let you know there are many ways to send us feedback here at the Quantum Leap Podcast. And we also want to ask for some iTunes reviews. It's been a while since we got any iTunes reviews and let people know what you think about us so they can listen to us too. Five star, five star, five star, five star, five star iTunes reviews, please. Yes. That would be great. But you can contact us on Facebook. At facebook.com slash quantum leap podcast. And on Twitter. At Quantum Leap Pod. And we even have an Instagram. Quantum Leap Podcast. Yeah. And you can email us. Quantum Leap Podcast at gmail.com. Right. And if you want to really talk to us and have your voice heard on the air, you can call us. At 707-847-6682. Make sure to call in. and That's all we're asking for. So send us some feedback. We want to know what you think. Right. And if you haven't liked us on Facebook yet, please do so. We like to post questions and get your opinions on things and your name can be mentioned on the show and your answer to the question. We try to keep you involved as possible. I love that so many of our listeners are so active on our Facebook page and they have their own discussions and it's great to just to read along, follow along, and sometimes I join in. Yeah, I, I love it. I try to avoid some of the discussions because I know that they can get a little spoilery on my part. But I really do like to hear what everybody has to say. It's pretty safe. Uh, A lot of our guys protect you. And if something's too spoilery, they go, hey, hey, Heather hasn't gotten there yet, guys. Yeah. See, a lot of the episodes are standalone, but some things are are big deals. There are some major (laughs) plot points that hopefully you don't get spoiled on. Hey, Brent Spiner ruined Star Trek for me. (laughs) He did. Why don't you tell that story real quick? (laughs) Um, So I had seen all the next gen seasons and i'd seen all the next gen movies except star trek nemesis and we went to megacon and we're listening to a panel and brent spiner spoiled the end of the movie for me (laughs) and he was like if you haven't seen it by now people and there was like three of you in the room and you were one of them but if anybody was gonna spoil the ending of star trek nemesis 
it was Brent Spiner. So I really can't even be that mad. <laughs> I looked right at you and I said, I told you you should have watched it. I know. And then we watched it and I, you know, couldn't believe it. But yeah, I I, I got spoiled by Brent Spiner. So <laughs> see, this is worrying me. Uh, we're going to Dragon Con this year. And they're doing, hopefully, a Quantum Leap panel. With I'm probably going to have to skip it. <laughs> Scott Bakula and Dean Stockwell and the whole bunch. And uh, I'm worried about you getting spoiled on that one. I, yeah, I might. I don't know. Do I skip it or do I go and get spoiled? I don't know because it's it's such a unique perspective that I have that I've never seen these episodes. So you get the fresh look at everything because I know that there are characters who are in the series more than once. And I know that there's storylines that connect and i would hate to not have that newbie perspective anymore even if you were spoiled with everything i think you would still love and enjoy the series but if i get spoiled it'll be spoiled by scott Bakula or dean stockwell exactly so you could be sitting one day going i got spoiled on next gen by brent spiner i got spoiled on quantum leap from scott Bakula. hey i was just born 20 years too late it's not my fault it's all right <laughs> i mean really Considering I was a baby when the show was on, most of the people my age have never even heard of this show. So we're changing that. Right. Little by little. I, I like this show and I, I would love to see a show like this on the air now. There's a lot of more sitcoms, I think, since the 90s. This was the end of like the sci-fi there was, family show genre. There was definitely a dip in the hour long drama format, but it's coming back. We had a great interview with Terry Hanauer. And uh, if you like interviews, we have a great interview for you on our next episode of the Quantum Leap Podcast. We have, from the episode Jimmy, the actor who played Frank LaMotta, Jimmy's brother, John D'Aquino. And that's a great interview, and I can't wait for you to hear it. It's in our next episode when we talk all about Jimmy. If Mr. Samuels asks, you're not retarded. You're just slow. He's going to get the job today. And well, what if he doesn't? Huh? What if he doesn't? I'm retarded. No. You're not retarded, Sam. Jimmy is. He's got the IQ of someone like 12 years old. Oh, boy. Anyway, he thinks you're here to, to mainstream Jimmy. Of course, in 64, they didn't mainstream the mentally handicapped. They locked them up in institutions. Which is where Jimmy's been. And that's where he's going to end up. That's what you're here to do. That. Make friends with your fellow workers. If you don't keep this monster away from my kids, I'll have him arrested. People like him belong in an institution. Don't tell me where my brother belongs, all right? I am really looking forward to the next episode. I've heard a lot of great things about it, so I'm excited to see Jimmy. I'm really looking forward to that episode. It's uh, one that I remember from my childhood, and it really had a big influence on my life, and I can't wait to talk about it. So until next time, this is Albie. And I'm Heather. May you always have a neurological hologram right next to you with all the answers. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Quantum Leap Podcast. Go to quantumleappodcast.com to listen to new episodes. The Quantum Leap Podcast is not affiliated with Belisarius Productions or Universal TV. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter to get behind-the-scenes information, exclusive content, and to be notified first when a new episode is available. The thoughts and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individual and do not necessarily represent or reflect those of the Quantum Leap Podcast, Baron Space Productions, its partners or affiliates. The Quantum Leap Podcast is edited by Albie and Juan. Research by Juan. Voice talent by John Buchanan. The Quantum Leap Universe and all it contains is the property of Belisarius Productions and Universal TV. No infringement is intended. The Quantum Leap Podcast is a barren space production. Rachel and Stan. Stan. I'm a winner today. What's the word I'm looking for? He's really starting to go all out. Huh? Acclimate? I would never use that word in a sentence. (laughs) (laughs) Well, after a little research, we found out that Chubby Checker was... uh, After a little... I'm back. Back from the future. Civil defense shelter. Okay. To the woman I want to... Sh- to the woman no, I no, most... No. Mo- Out my butt. Going back. You're... It went a bit... Uh, it went a bit... Uh, it went a bit silly then. I do it again. <clears throat> it went a bit silly then. I can't talk. Went a bit. You're like, went a bit. Yeah. Next time on the Quantum Leap Podcast, we are talking about thou shalt not. Thou, not thou. Thou shalt not. Say it again. It just sounded like you said the vowel. Next time on the Quantum Leap Podcast, 
Next time on the Quantum Leap Podcast, we'll be talking about Thou Shall Not. Shalt not. Thou shalt not. <laughs> I have the weird words I don't use. Next time on the Quantum Leap Podcast, we'll be talking about Thou Shall Not. Thou. Do you want me to do it? You're, you still sing thou. Tha- thou. Thou. It's got a W at the end. Yes. No, it doesn't. It has a U. Okay. Uh. Like out. Every O-U-T. letter makes a sound. The U says W. <laughs> no. But thou, T-H-O-U. I'm going to fix this. What's funny is that would say tho. Stop it. Many of the female guests discuss their disbelief at burp still. (laughs) It's funny because every time I say anything, I know it's going to go on there. Terry Hanauer and James Tiberius. Sutorius. Okay. I love um, that you say beggles, like B-E-G-G-E-L-S. I'm from New Jersey. Beggles. So am I. <laughs> Beagles? Bagels. When a bagel? Bagel. Bagel. <laughs> I give up. No, tell me. Bagel. 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 Like two words. Right. Like a seagull, but that flies in the bay. Right. Of course I eat bagels. <laughs> bagels? Yeah. Of course I eat bagels chives in my sour cream and my cheese cream so you don't cake. have flops hold on. hold on or i like everything bagels or onion bagels with sour with cream cheese with man you started it <laughs> you messed me up with bagels okay <clears throat>